Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Grace Gummer to talk all about her series, Let the Right One In. And, and I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how you worked in terms of your character development process to utilize the, the little details that those early scripts were really giving you. You know, when we first meet her and we see her dad calling, there's so much unpatched just in a singular scene, even though it's just you in that scene by yourself at that point of what this relationship dynamic is, the estrangement, what that's meant to her, where she is professionally. Um, and so how did you really find that there were a lot of details in the, in those first couple of scripts that gave you a lot to build off of? And was that relationship with her dad kind of part of the initial jumping off point for you? Definitely. I mean, with a brand new story and a brand new show, you know, there isn't, especially with just a pilot episode, which is what we had in the beginning, there's not so much to work with. So um, I had to sort of which is what I usually, I love doing, which is working with the director or the showrunner um, or the writer and, and figuring out her backstory and, you know, making up actually, because it's not, not all there, but making it up for myself, for all of us, so that we all have an understanding of um, where she's coming from, where she came from 10 years ago, where she's at in her life, you know, does she have a dog? Is she in a relationship? Like, does she have a boyfriend? What's, who is this, like building the world and the life of this woman um, to sort of give myself a sense of, of where I was coming into the story and with, with how much, you know, uh, fortitude and force and like, um, you know, the, the, the engine that's driving her. Um, but what was so interesting about this was that it was, I start out in the first three minutes of the show, you know, when you see me the first two minutes of the show in a completely different world, thinking a completely different thing. And then my life is upended in a matter of minutes. So it was, it was really like uh, building up a character, breaking her down and then rebuilding her um, episode to episode. So yeah, I mean, usually the way I work is 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 really sitting down with whatever scripts I have and just going through uh, generally um, like scheduling just like timelines of when things happened and um, the, the, the sequence of, you know, the order of everything that really helps my brain uh, know where I'm coming from and, and know where I'm where I've where I've been, where I'm going to, especially with block shooting TV shows, a lot of the time you shoot completely out of order. So sometimes hard to remember what you've already shot, what you've already lived through, what you've experienced, what you haven't yet. So it's good to keep that sort of template and that Bible for yourself. That's really wonderful. And I also love something that Andrew Hinderaker, who's the showrunner of this series, kind of said to you early on in, in consideration of even taking the role of really seeing it as a story about what it means to love someone with an addiction, yeah. um, which is so prevalent for your character. Um, and I was really interested in how that really informed a lot of the way that you've ended up creating her in the show and really navigating through a show that has these surreal elements to it, but through something incredibly grounded and connected with the emotional tissue of that. Yeah, totally. I mean, that was the thing that I remember I was in a cab and I was like, I was, it was right before my callback. And I, you know, when you, when you sign on to do a TV show, sometimes it's, it, you're signing on years, you're signing on to years of your life. So you're like, wait, maybe I have to ask these questions about like what, what it is to him that he's interested in, me. you know, like why, why should I be interested in this show? Why should I be drawn to this person? And, and what, what, what's your vision that, that, um, that I want to be a part of? Cause you're so used to as an actor being like, yeah, I'll be a part of whatever. And, and my, I'll bring whatever you, what you want me to bring. Um, but I was so curious to know why he wanted to remake this, this story, because we've, we've seen this movie, we've seen, we've seen the American version of this movie. We've, there's a book, you know, and he, when he said that to me, and I remember being in a cab and um, looking out the window and just looking at the Hudson river. And he was like, it's for me, honestly, it's, it's a real larger metaphor for what, for battling addiction and what it's like to love someone 
who suffers from this problem. And there's this scene in the movie, in the original movie, where the Swedish movie where she, um, the little girl jumps off of this like walkway bridge and lands on top of a guy in this, you know, in the middle of this like snowy walkway and starts just like, just out of pure physical need to, to, to be alive and to stay alive is, is starts sucking his blood and his neck. And that Andrew referenced that scene and how he really saw that as, as, you know, the, the need maybe to drink or the, the need to, to do drugs or like, and, and then all these other people around you um, or all these other people around the person suffering, what lengths they will go to and what, you know, their journey and their story is what it takes out of them physically, emotionally, everything um, to not only keep them alive, but to keep them happy and to, and to keep loving them. Um, all of that. It's, 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 and when you bring in children as the victims, instead of like villains, um, it's, it's really, really, it's really interesting. It is. And one of the things that really strikes me in, in Claire as a character as well is just seeing the the kind of guard that she has up around anybody because of her family dynamic. I mean, in essence, between the estrangement from her dad, thinking that she lost her brother and her mother leaving, she's essentially grieved, mourned and lost her entire family at a young age. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, there's a lot of walls of protectiveness and whether it's kind of a sarcastic sense of humor or just mm -hmm. not allowing people to be close and, and trustworthy to her early on. Um, and so how did you kind of construct what you felt those defense mechanisms were to protect herself emotionally and then kind of start to navigate through well, what does it look like when she starts to trust someone like Matthew a little bit that immediately she, you know initially she's very antagonistic towards yeah I mean I think having lost her mom and having lost her dad and been a mother figure to her to her brother um you know made her and moving away and and sort of diving deep into her work and making her life be essentially completely all about her work. I think that those were her defenses, her, her research and her, her love of science and her love to be good at her job. Um, and her need to also like right the wrongs of her father and not do, not do what he did, you know, or not be the person that he did. Um, I think that because she's found herself having to completely rearrange her life and her life has been upended and to forget her old life. She's in this, she's in this really weird place of extreme power and vulnerability at the same time. And to trust anyone like trusting anyone her whole life has felt um, detrimental and foreign to her. And she's had to sort of, do it all herself that anyone especially associated with her dad is someone not to be trusted so uh yeah initially in the beginning she's I don't know how much I can reveal but she's like you know obviously very uh wary of Matthew and his whole relationship with her father uh, but then grows to understand and know how she needs him and how uh, she can utilize him and his, and his powers um, and, you know, what he can do for her and then how, he, how she can sort of let her guard down and, and be a little bit more of a human being. I think that's a little bit of a relief for her. And with her relationship with her brother, you know, she's essentially grieved and mourned his passing because that's what she believed happened for all these years. And then what she's confronted with is, is still kind of a, a different type of grief and kind of a grief for the person that he was and that he could have been in the world against the reality for him in his day to day. Um, and so how did you kind of view that relationship of what does that element of grief and, and mourning an idea of someone that you've already grieved in a very different way look like? Yeah, that's such a great question. It's an interesting thing because she got a chance to grieve the person that she lost and, but, but it was fake, you know, she was lied to about it. So it feels like it wasn't really earned, which is, it's 
feels so um, like a betrayal. And, and then, you know, mourning the like subhuman, not really human, not really existing in the, our world, but not in another world yet person who is unrecognizable to her. Um, I don't know. I always really, for me, Grace playing Claire, I saw him still as her little brother because he was, he's, what's so fucked up about it is that he's still stuck in time and he's still the same age that he was when he died. So um, there was, it was, it was sort of like, there was no, for me, there was, there was sort of no seeing him as this deformed vampire. It was more of like, oh, here's my brother that I, that I didn't get the past 10 years with, or he, you know, who I thought was gone forever that I get to see again. Like that to me was more palpable and more real and more relatable and accessible than, um, you know, thinking he was a completely different thing and being and um, mourning the, the grief of that. And especially because of, of her relationship with, with science, you know, we see both the emotional side and then also just the logistical way in which she sees this as a problem to be solved. And, you know, the, the way that she asks very logical questions, like, could you hear me when you were feeding after she's passed through the emotional landscape of what that meant? Um, and so how did you view the dynamic of the moments where the emotion would be the overriding element in watching him and, and rebuilding this dynamic and the moments where she was coming at it from more of a logistical standpoint because she is trying to figure out solutions for him. I mean, I think it was, you know, especially as an actor putting myself in these situations where you have to imagine someone you love most in the world eating a human being alive and tearing their head off is like, you can't actually fully imagine that, but, um, you can put yourself in those emotional situations where the person you love the most is suffering, no matter what it looks like, you know, logistically, it doesn't matter like how much blood, how much, how much anguish, how much like physical deformity, um, how many burns he has all over his body. It's like still within that there's that human being that you love so much that it's like, it, yeah, all the logistics of it don't matter. Does that answer your question, sort of? It, it does, yeah. And, you know, I also love that in the, the sibling dynamic, there's elements that just feel like them going back to who they were when they were kids with one another. Yeah. Um, so like, there's a scene in one of the episodes where she's trying to kind of, like, surgically remove some of the damaged flesh from being yeah. in the sunlight. And at the same time, they're joking with each other in the midst of totally. a really tender moment where he's like, thank you for not giving up on me and, and still being here. Um, totally. And so how did you kind of view what the dynamic would have looked like when they were kids together as siblings and then how that would be reflected at the present as adults where you have both of those sides coexisting in the same moment? I think that they're still there. It's like the, the, the language that you have with your siblings and your family is what you have with them your whole life. Like you speak a, you speak a secret language with each other and that doesn't go away. And I think that, you know, the idea of him being eating people alive and, and being this monster is she, I think she like forgets sometimes because she can't think of him like that. It's too painful for her to think of him like that. So but definitely, I feel like there's times where she's like, wait, you've, you've done that. Like, who are you? Who actually have you turned into? And do I know you? And what is this world that I'm living in? And what has happened to me? And what am I trying to do? And, um, but I think that like, at the heart and soul of it, for me, especially as an actor was just like, what would you, what would you do to, to, keep this this being that you love so deeply in your life they make you happy they're they're the source of your your joy and your happiness in your life like there's nothing else that, I mean I have I have two sisters and a brother and I don't know they're my best friends like I, I can't imagine living without them so there's there's something so 
just human in this story and non monstery vampire vampiric that's why i think sometimes when i'm watching the show i'm like oh my god it's so scary like it's so gory or like when i see what we actually shot versus you know or what it what the scene actually is versus what we actually shot because what we actually shot is me looking at a blank wall or me looking at you know two stunt guys doing something or like not actually my brother tearing off you know someone's head and sucking their blood uh it's it's so upsetting <laughs> but i think it's utilized and used in a really um in a non gratuitous interesting smart way it it is in that that idea that Your you were cat. just saying of uh, <laughs> part of the processing for her being that you know she almost just regresses it and, and can't think of it with that in mind and and knowing that she needs to be able to walk herself back from a place of fear when it came to filming the scene where she sees him feeding on someone for the first time and what that reality is you know there's so much fear and unknown for her in that moment and so how did you find the line of how far can I carry her in terms of her response but knowing that we have to be able to walk back from this I think I allowed myself to feel fucking everything and to to really to really go there to really have her experience what it would actually look like and feel like um like to 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 witness something like that is is so, so deeply disturbing but to also to remember that she has, you know, the trust in herself and the strength to be like, nope, I'm going to keep working and I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this track and I'm going to help him, you know, to remember that no matter what gruesome, horrific actions he's going to take because he has to stay alive. Those aren't really him. That's not, it's like that scene where she's like, it's not you, it's the virus. Like it's this other thing taking over your life and your, and your personhood and, and your soul. Like it's not, it's greater than you and it's not your fault. Um, that really, I think grounded me and helped me go back to those places where I was like, uh, how could I even love someone like that? You know, how could I even still live in the same house with this thing? And, and, seeing him even as a thing and not as a, as a, as a boy, you know, but to remember that it was actually a bigger, larger problem. Yeah. And that I could, I alone can fix. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out by the end of the season. <laughs> exactly. You'll see. Stay tuned. <laughs> and in talking a little bit about her relationship with her dad as well, which obviously there's so much to unpack for her in returning into a space that she has intentionally distanced herself from for several years um you know I kind of love the way that when she first walks back in and has that speech where she's kind of just unleashing everything that she always felt upset by and frustrated by and angry about you know it's it's that idea of when you haven't seen someone for a long time and you don't imagine that you'll see them but what would I say to them if I ever saw it? So it kind of felt like she, she'd had that conversation in her head a lot of times. And, and so how did that idea of this is a conversation that she's played in her mind several times influence how you imagined and envisioned her walking back into his home, you know, but also with the added element of knowing that he's dying, but refusing to engage with that. I don't think she expected to see, or, or even to see him in the state like to see her dad in the state that he is like walking in and seeing her brother in the state that she is definitely did not definitely did not expect that. But even, I think even walking into the house, she didn't expect it. She didn't ever think that she would go back in that house and seeing him so sick and so sort of pathetic and, um, and literally on, you know, death's door. I think that that was, so, something I actually didn't think about before when I first read it, but was hard, you know, cause she's not a heartless person. I think that she has, it's her dad. Like she has, she does have a little bit of pity and empathy. And, and I think that that, I remember Seath, the director saying, it's actually, I think it's actually sort of jarring and sort of hard to see her dad in, in, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to hate someone when they're like 
this when they're like Trump, you know, but as soon as Trump was like, <laughs> had COVID, everyone was like, oh, he's a person. Not that we like him. We hate him. But, you know, it's, I think it was harder for her to, to actively keep hating him. And, and she did, but I think that that's why, I don't know how much you watched or how much when this is going to air, but I think it's, it's not so black and white, her relationship with him. It's estranged and it's totally something she'd never thought she'd revisit. Um, but she knows that she has to. And I, and I, I don't actually know if she replayed or if she like expected to, ex- to s- explain or say, or have that speech that she did when she came in. I think, I think she so has so many deep defenses and boundaries uh, and walls up that, that I found that that's what she felt she wanted to say when she walked in the house, like in that moment, I think she wanted to say a lot of other horrible things and probably could have. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, it's all of it. It's anger, it's resentment, but it's also kind of feeling bad for him and not really knowing her place and and feeling like, I mean, there's a scene where um, that we shot that he sort of, you know, falls a little bit, like he stumbles in his heart, his, he grabs his heart and he's obviously physically not well. And she's instinctually just grabs him and is like, are you okay? You know, I think that like, that shows her heart too. And I don't know, know if it necessarily shows any kind of love that she has for him, but it definitely shows and, and, you know, a person with empathy. And, you know, kind of similar to the way that there's elements of her childhood that come up again in the relationship with her brother, there's also kind of that idea of protecting the child that felt hurt and abandoned in that dynamic as well. And, and again, with that idea of protectiveness and boundaries that the anger allows her to keep that distance. Um, but were there moments where you kind of viewed the anger as like, you know, maybe the heart's coming through a little bit too much and she doesn't feel comfortable with it. So anger is the reactionary emotion that's going to drive her to keep that space for herself. Definitely. And I think that's what, that's what has kept her away and has kept her sort of the guarded person that she is. And then she comes home and realizes that she can't actually be that person anymore. And she's spent several years kind of being able to be the one in that dynamic with the moral high ground of like, well, you did this and you did that and you made all these choices and you knew what you were doing. And now, you know, through even just the first few episodes, the morality for her as a, as a character has shifted so much with the justification of, I never would have done this or considered this, but for my brother and to protect him, I'm going to. Yeah. Um, and so how have you, how have you kind of navigated through or viewed that evolving relationship in terms of her moral compass and, and the fact that she's gone from a place of the moral high ground and having a lot of pride in her choices to not being able to claim that anymore? Yeah. Well, I think that, um, <laughs> I think that you can never really have a plan for your life or how you want to like, really go for it through it because it's uh, something always is going to happen I mean that's life there's going to be a hurricane there's going to be an earthquake there's going to be someone's going to die someone's going to um you know whatever and so I think that I think it was really fun to play with a character who's who had everything just turned upside down and had her own um her own plans and her own visions for herself and her life and who she is as a woman be completely um, sort of not proved wrong, but like sort of spit back in her face and laughed at, like, remember who you are and remember where you come from. And this actually can be something you can utilize and can be used for good, even though it's bad. There's also something that I've seen you mention in regards to working on this show and, and particularly with 
the emotional space that that you had to find yourself in frequently for this character, especially as the episodes progress and, and just that idea of, you know, being able to step into that space is that you almost have to like warm up into it and then warm out of it afterwards. And so I was really interested in what that dynamic looks like for you when you're kind of going into all of these production days, especially because like you were saying, when you're block shooting, you're also jumping around to a lot of different emotional layers and levels for the character, even within totally. a single day. Totally. It's so it's so fucking hard. It's like the hardest part about what I do. It's so hard and it's hard to not let it follow you home and not let it follow you down the street and through your day the next day. And, um, you know, you have to really convince yourself on a, on a cellular level that you believe these things and that you, and that you are that person and that you're seeing these things and witnessing them for the first time and, and how that would feel to like, to, to live in that place. It's, it's, but then you remember it's fucking make believe, you know, <laughs> you know, and it also should be fun. And then there's crafty and there's somebody on set that's making you laugh. And like there's fajitas and someone brought donuts, whatever. And it's, it's hard to like, to bring yourself back and forth between those two things, but it's, um, it's part of why I, I love doing it. And also because I'm, I'm not a very, I'm not a dark soul. You know, I don't, I don't live in this sort of um, dark world that a lot of the characters I play live in. So I don't have that kind of, I, I don't have that kind of like deep, dark inner turmoil. So it's really fun to be able to, to access it and play with it on set and at work. And then you know, I feel like I've said this so many times, but I would come home from work and my husband would be like, are you mad at me? <laughs> I was like, no, I just had to like be mad at everybody all day, you know, or like watch my brother tear off someone's head. Like you have no idea what I've had to convince myself of um, deep down that I've, that I've seen and, and felt. And because if you don't believe it, no one else is going to believe it. So, you know, I, I take a lot of walks. I work out. I watch Real Housewives. <laughs> I go see my friends. Like I, but I also try to remember, um, you know, how to stay in it and how to not uh, lose it because it is something that's hard to. You can't kind of like let it leave your body either. But also, you have to know that it. it you trust yourself to know that it lives within you somewhere, which is also terrifying. And with the relationship that you have with any character as well, there's always, you know, the idea of, of who they're going to end up being once you're living within them and, and building that dynamic. And then there's always elements that just kind of take you to a place that you wouldn't have even expected or anticipated. And with, with Claire, what did you find were some of the surprising elements that you discovered in her that maybe you wouldn't have envisioned when you were first reading the scripts? That's a really great question. I actually felt like she had a lot more fear and sort of tender vulnerability and um yeah there's sort of an a, an emptiness in her somewhere that uh like a like a loneliness that i found was sort of sad that needed to be loved um because I, I went into it thinking that she was this strong, and she is this strong boss lady, but she's got, um, yeah, she's got a lot of fear and vulnerability there. I thought that was really fun to play with, especially with the scenes with Matthew and later on in the season with, uh, with some other people, like it's, that was really surprising to me. I thought, I thought it was all sort of like, grit and humor and and strength and um like a doctor you know like I know what to do but there's so many layers and um and so much love there like not just for her brother but yeah I mean, I, I love how that's one of the elements that just like makes it so richly complex as a character to get to play on screen and really love your performance in the episodes I've seen so far and can't wait Thank to watch the season. Thank you so much, Grace. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's really fun.